during the early 2000s, um, uh, substance use uh, touched my family like it touches many families. I reacted the wrong way, like many people do. Uh, codependence is a big piece of this. Covering up, hiding, yeah. getting angry, yes. and treating it almost as, well, treating it as a, as a character flaw. All of the things that push an individual away from treatment, I did. Substance use disorder touches all our lives, and often we feel hopeless or frustrated in our pursuit to understand how and why it happens. Welcome to APC Recovery Cafe, where we discuss the topics and trends around substance use, provide education and resources, offer recovery support, and also discuss prevention tactics all through the stories of the people who have been there. We invite you to grab your favorite coffee or tea and join us for a variety of guests that will bring understanding, information, connection, and hope. Together, we can break the stigma and pave a brighter future for each other. Hi, folks. Welcome into this edition of the APC Recovery Cafe. My name is Art Wimberly. I'm a volunteer at the Addiction Prevention Coalition, a person grateful to be in long-term recovery. And this morning, I'm in the studio with the Executive Director of APC, Carrie Wimberly. Hey, Carrie. Good morning. Good morning. Carrie, you want to introduce us to our guest? I do. I'm really excited to have Dr. John Dantzler with us today. Um, John is on our uh, APC board. Thank you for that. Happy um, and I have to go to my notes here. Yeah. John is a um, professor at the Department of Psychiatry at UAB and the vice chair of addiction programs. Um, and I just think of you as the person at Beacon, you know, that so works. you got yeah. you, you wear a lot of hats here, yeah. but um, it, you're probably over more than what I'm thinking. So tell me, what does that encompass? Sure. And hey, thanks for having me. Yes. This is, this is great. Welcome. So um, glad you're here. Yeah, we do a lot. Yeah. And uh, I'm in the Department of Psychiatry. Yeah. And uh, the division that I am I run is the Substance Use Division. Okay. That division has multiple three arms, really. Okay. We have our treatment arm. When you talk about Beacon, that's what you're thinking of. Yes. Outpatient and intensive outpatient treatment. And that's our second largest group. Okay. That has about, we have about, almost 40 staff members, and uh, it's, it's a pretty good size. Our largest group is our community justice programs, okay. and we do a lot of work. That has about 70 staff members. They do a lot of work in the uh, court systems, yep. uh, working with people who are justice involved. Uh, we are a community corrections provider for Jefferson County, so if you happen to be in prison or headed to prison, um, and on a non nonviolent charge, yep. you might be able to come to us. If okay. You have just two years or less uh, on your sentence. So we work with we work with offenders uh, with the Department of Corrections, and we also in that set of programs we operate all of the treatment courts for Jefferson County. So it's it's pretty it's a lot. It's pretty in depth. Yeah. And then of course we have our family and adolescent programs that's yep. run by Suzanne Muir. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, over that. Similar to the adult community justice, they work with individuals who, not, not always, but are justice involved yes. on the family court side or the you know, family and adolescent uh, court side. And uh, but that's that's a smaller set of programs. So and then I task just, that that's what it, what it, tell me what task. Well, is. this is a long story. I got to. I'm so sorry. In. I, I got to settle in. So task <laughs> treatment alternatives for safer communities. Yes, was. From the 1970s, early 1970s, up until 2015, 2016, what we call now the Substance Abuse Division okay. was TASC. And it operated underneath the uh, Department of Psychiatry umbrella, okay. but almost like a de facto nonprofit. Right. And when I was brought in as a faculty member, they, uh, they being School of Medicine and Department of Psychiatry, asked that we pull that task unit more into the academic mission okay. of, of the department. So okay. some people still refer to task. Just think of task is the same as the substance abuse division okay. of psychiatry. I knew I had seen it there, and yeah. I, I did not know where to place it, yeah. you know, based on That's all right. that y'all were doing. Yeah. 
Well, before we go any further, we got to do the important stuff. Yes, so I'm so sorry. A, your your morning drink here today. Can you describe that? This is this typical for you, as far as what you drink each morning. Each coffee? morning, this is my substance of choice. Okay. <laughs> um, this is uh, this is coffee art with half and half, and okay. you did a very good job of Thank the you. half and half. Thank and you. that's I appreciate it. that's all I need. Sometimes I don't even use the half and half. Uh, I learned to drink black coffee in college because I didn't have enough money for cream <laughs> or sugar. I was it was all I could do to just get the beans. So yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and I mean people that go to school for years and years seem to be they addicted to coffee. Yes, there yes. there's a coffee element in yeah. in many yeah. of the stories. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yep. I so, should not drink as much. So speaking of school, okay, yep. so your undergrad was in South Carolina? South Is Carolina. Right? Presbyterian yep. College. Presbyterian where, College. Where were you born? I was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh wow. Uh, my father was a um, Presbyterian minister. Okay. And he had a church in Nashville. Um, my sister and I were born there, nineteen sixty six. Uh, my sister was a little bit older than me. I don't remember anything about it. it was, <laughs> shortly thereafter, he moved to uh, Georgia. Uh, okay. He decided he wanted to be a um, pastoral counselor, okay. a chaplain and a pastoral counselor. So he did his uh, training in Georgia and Atlanta. And um, those are my first memories. Then when I was about six, we moved to a little town in, uh, uh, in, in Alabama called Homewood. You know it well, I'm sure. How about that? Right here in Homewood. Right here. Homewood. Okay. So I grew up in Homewood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. All right. So how'd you end up in South Carolina at school? What, what oh, going back to, okay. So, well, South Carolina Presbyterian College, my father was a Presbyterian minister. He went to Presbyterian College. Okay. And um, I remember when I was looking at college, uh, I was looking at, and I'm sorry, at this at Auburn. Oh, uh, we're, uh, we're going to need to end I know the we edit that. <laughs> Auburn and um, uh, uh, Hampton, Sydney, and Virginia, and a couple of others. And my father said, "Hey, go check out Presbyterian College." Yeah. I said, "No, I'm good. I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I don't. I, I found where I wanted to go." He said, "Come on, let's just go." So we went uh, and toured one summer, the summer before my senior year, and fell in love with it. How about it's that? It's a beautiful place. Uh, small liberal arts college. Uh, I haven't been back in a few years, but yeah, Clinton, South Carolina. And so, what when you went? What what did you think you were going to do at that time? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me why, but I was going to be a dentist. Um, okay. And um, John and chemistry did not do well together, so that was out the window the first semester. Um, but I found psychology. How about that? I loved psychology. And that led me down the road of, I thought I was going to be a clinical psychologist, but I later realized I really love the um, social, social sci science research, statistics, uh, methodology. And so that's so that's re I used to. research seems to be the thread. Research is the thread. Okay. Um, right. I had a um, wonderful professor at Presbyterian College. A guy named Dr. Tim, Tim Gaines, he uh, introduced me to statistics and research methods, and I loved it. Wow, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So from there, uh, you did your master's work at Tuscaloosa? Is that no, I did not. not. Yeah. I uh, After I graduated, I, I um, came back to, to Birmingham and worked for a couple of years, but then started, still had in my mind that I wanted to, to go into clinical psychology. But I wanted to start off with a counseling degree. So I started at UAB in their counseling program to get a master's. And I um, had another wonderful professor, Dr. Scott Snyder, who grabbed me one day and said, you know, you're really good at this research stuff. Have you thought about educational research? And I had not. And I took a few courses. And so I switched my degree over to educational research. And... Um, then moved on a few years later to a doctorate in uh, educational research. And that's how, how it all started. Okay, so tell me, give me an example, like educational research. What, what does that mean? Educational research is, um, just as it sounds, yeah. research and education. Yeah. Looking at educational practices, um, uh, looking at how, uh, researching how students learn, 
how teachers teach, that kind of thing. Uh, but it is it encompasses all of just basic research methods, um, quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis. I was uh, I was a psychometrician, so psychometrics was an area. I never even heard that word. Psychometrics. Uh, you were talking about um, Burroughs yeah, uh, uh, yeah. earlier. Development of instruments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, validation of of instruments, and so I did that for a little bit. Loved that, wow. um, and statistics. So, all of these research methods to become a well-rounded researcher. That's really what educational research did for uh, me. And 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 all that can sound very dry and very academic. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, <laughs> I know that. Uh, I don't know how it ended up this way, but the field that you're in, using your your knowledge and your study and your expertise, though, has ended up in anything uh, but a field that's very dry. And that's you're so much involved with the recovery and prevention community in in Alabama. So we always ask our guests that come in whether they're you know in a recovery background personally or they're just a professional or a lay helper in the field. So we, we know most people didn't grow up thinking this is what I'm going to end up. How, how did it, can you tell us how it kind of segued? Into sure, that? sure. Yeah. And it's funny, I, 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 it, you mentioned this. I was talking to my daughters. I have three daughters in their 20s. And we were talking about how do you go from high school and deciding on, hey, I want to do this, to what you do one day. And yeah. it's the path is always curvy. Yeah. And that's the way that's the way life is. Yeah. Um, how did I get into this position? Um, we'll go back to educational research. We go yep. back to my connection to psychology and counseling. I worked for a period of time for about five years after my master's at United Way of Central Alabama. And in in my capacity as an assistant director of planning, I worked with a lot of nonprofit uh, executive directors. Now this gets really dry, but around 1993, 94, I'm going to say 93, uh, Congress passed uh, the GIPRA Act, the uh, Government Performance Results Act. What that did was it required anybody who receives funding, uh, grant funding from the federal government to evaluate what, what they have do. done to make sure that you're using the dollars appropriately, but also that you're doing what you said you were going to mm -hmm. do. These executive directors had no idea what evaluation was. I was trained in it, oddly, in educational research. So I started helping them do that. That led to me just starting a business, a consulting business in evaluation, Wow. program evaluation. So I left United Way, started, started the business, also started a doctoral program, and worked with a number of nonprofits in whatever programs they were receiving federal money for. Uh, I started off with a lot of HIV, AIDS work, uh, AIDS Alabama, yeah. uh, Birmingham AIDS Outreach, did a lot of yeah. evaluations there. But that quickly also uh, moved me to work with um, substance use treatment, mm -hmm. Aletheia House. Mm -hmm. Task was yeah. one of the was one of my clients. Yeah. So at that so starting way back, way back then in the early two thousands, uh, late nineties, I was doing work with nonprofits in again many different areas: housing, yeah. substance use, mental health. Yeah. But substance use was a big piece of 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 the business. Later on, so I'm doing this, then I get into academia, and one day, you know, I still do a lot of work with, with TASC, mm -hmm. and uh, I get a call, hey, we are, we're looking for an executive director mm -hmm. for TASC. Uh, the guy who was there for and built the uh, uh, TASC program over 40 years, uh, you may have heard him, Foster Cook. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Foster. So Foster called me, and he said, hey, look, I'm going to retire. Psychiatry wants... Somebody in academia to come in and, and take this over. You know what we do. Would you be interested? I said, no. <laughs> and so he, he, Was that hard for you? 
<laughs> not at all. I said, I said, no way. I have a good job. I'm enjoying teaching uh, grad students. It was great. Uh, he called again. Hey, are you sure? No. Yeah. Third time, I said, I'll come talk to, I'll come talk to uh, the chair of psychiatry, a guy named uh, Jim Metter Woodruff. And we talked, and um, he sold it. He sold me on it, and it allowed me to. I was living in Homewood, commuting to Tuscaloosa, and so one of the big decisions was, well, I like what task does. I also am tired of driving. So it worked out, and that's how I got into administration in the School of Medicine. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's your curvy path. Yeah. There's yeah. your curvy path, but I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, on a personal note, during the early 2000s, um, uh, substance use uh, touched my family like it touches many families. Yeah. And um, I reacted the wrong way, like many people do. Yeah. So I had a vested interest in working in the field and at least trying to help where where I can, uh, yeah. even if it's just as an administrator. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, clearly you've been in the space for a while. I mean, when was that? When did you join Oh, as the ED. It's the ED. Well, that was 2015. So okay. I, you know, nine years. This is Interact. my ninth year there. But I've been working with substance use programs since in the 90s. Late 90s. Yeah, late 90s. Okay, so you have a a vantage point, a viewpoint that many of us don't have, as far as seeing what's happening. You know, not only in use, but in treatment. So. I would love to pick your brain about, you know, like where we've come in the treatment space and, you know, learning more about substance use disorder, how to treat it, what's effective, what's not, and where you think we're headed. That's a big question. That is a big question. Um, I, uh, I'll i start with a caveat. I'm, I'm, I'm very clear. I am not a clinician. Right. So, and I've said that I am yeah. not a clinician. I know a lot about it, but I'm not yeah. a clinician. So I'm very careful not to right. uh, get too clinical. Yeah. But what what I, I can say is that early 90s and before even mid 90s, even late 90s, there was still, and there still is a stigma attached to substance use and Absolutely. substance use treatment. Yeah. Uh, always was treated as a moral failing, yeah. as a uh, lack of or you know, character, or, you know, all of these things. We know that's not the case now. Right. Or we, we should know. We should know that's not the case. Yeah. The brain-based model, disease model, came about as a conversation in the late 90s, as you know, yeah. and then, you know, really took hold in the 2000s and 2000s up to now. And we subscribe to that model, of course. Right. In, uh, yeah. University of Alabama at Birmingham, Academic Medical Center, we do treat substance use uh, as a substance use disorders as a brain-based issue, brain-based yeah. disease. Yeah. I think that alone has been one of the biggest shifts over time. And, and as you, know, you all know very well, stigma, well, st stigma kills. Yeah, And so, not to be too dramatic, but it does. Yeah. We really have to, we have to take the stigma out of treatment. Yes, uh, We don't stigmatize people with cancer. Right. We don't stigma, stigmatize people with diabetes. Right. Still, we have this, this, um, this feeling, there are people in society that still have the feeling that it is a, um, it is a moral failing, and it yeah. is not. Right. And so, that shift... I've seen over time, and I've yep. seen uh, uh, how treatment options really have focused on the brain-based piece of this. Yeah. The other thing, and, I, and, and that that I, I that our division, our department, UAB Medicine, we work with individuals who don't have a lot of money, yeah, and uh, or any and. And, and one of the, the problems with substance use uh, disorders, many problems, but one of the problems with treatment is that substance use is a cyclical disease, right? Yep. We expect and we think, you know, just like cancer, you have remission and you have, you know, uh, 
uh, cancer cells uh, you know, yeah. are, are, are present in the body over time, in and out of treatment, in and out of remission. Same with substance use treatment. It takes time. Yeah. And it's it's rare yeah. for somebody to go through treatment once and right. say, done. Yeah. Relapse is generally going to be part, part of the, of the story. Process. All, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. always, but yeah. many, many yeah. times. Yeah. And yeah. we have to understand that. But what is the effect? The effect is that the individual has less and less uh, money, resources. fewer resources. Yeah. Uh, they've tapped resources with, with family members. They have, yeah. they have used up a lot of resources because it is an expensive disease as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was just looking the other day. Treatment, outpatient treatment, can cost anywhere between fourteen hundred a month to five thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Uh, um, inpatient treatment, residential treatment, can cost five thousand to eighty thousand yeah. a month. Yeah. It's expensive. Yep. And insurance often does not pay a lot or anything, and that's uh, that's a, that's a problem as well. Yeah. So what do you have? Yeah. You have individuals who have a who have a brain-based disease that are going through treatment and that treatment takes time and resources are limited. So now you can get my soapbox. I'm passionate about this. We at Beacon Recovery, if we're going to let's look at our treatment side, um, we call the justice side invitation only. So the treatment side, you pay no more than $100 a month on a sliding scale, depending on your income. Yeah. And I'm thankful to the Alabama Department of Mental Health. We have a contract with with Department of Mental Health to provide these services. It is important that we have affordable treatment options. Yeah. And that's, as we're talking about what, what I'm seeing as, as we're moving through history, yes. Yes. is the recognition that that you have to have these affordable options. Yeah. Yeah. So with, with Beacon, again, to, to clarify, if I heard you right earlier, we're talking about outpatient and intensive outpatient, Correct. right? Uh, can you talk, and I want to get more detail about that sure. because I know somebody's going to see this and they may have a loved one or they themselves, that may be something that would benefit them. Mm-hmm. Um, but also talk about uh, what seems to be in the state of Alabama, um, uh, to be polite, a dearth of uh, in- inpatient treatment that is affordable. Uh, without getting political, UAB even has a history of having to lose a program or deciding to end that. Mm-hmm. So where do you see the state going? Or can you give us some ideas about are there any uh, pathways to increasing affordable inpatient treatment in this state? Or the, what are the hurdles Without getting you in trouble too much. No, right? no, no. This, this, this. I'll stay on my soapbox. Here. Yeah. Um, residential treatment is necessary in many, many cases, and not all cases, but necessary right. in many cases. Yeah. Residential treatment is extremely expensive. Yep. And to, to UAB did have a small residential program for a while, but it's just you know, with the combination of the expense. With uh, insurance, my understanding, we don't take insurance, but my understanding is that set of programs, were, they were seeing that uh, fewer insurance dollars were coming in. Right. And they could not sustain. Yeah. And so it wasn't a decision that was made lightly, I will say. Yeah. Right. I do remember that. Yeah. But I, I tell you, it's the people that went through that program, I mean, you know, are still some of our friends and people that we work with. I mean, there were so many stories of, Absolutely. I mean, people – really had profound experiences in that program. They really did. And that tells you the strength and the power of a small residential program. Yes. We had uh, physicians uh, and we had counselors and peers, Uh, not we. This is that, that program is the addiction recovery Mm -hmm. uh, program. That is another program at UAB that is insurance and private pay. So, and and highly recommend ARP still does um, outpatient work. So, but the, the residential program was the power again of that small yes. program is 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 evident there. Well, and I think that, that you know uh, the other piece was, you know, that group of people were sold into the brain based model to the point of 
loving on the the people that came in there, you know, and and treating them as with respect. Yes, and yeah. as patients, you know, as right. not as you've hit rock bottom and you've failed in life, you know, right. changing that line, that tagline for for people, and when you know, many of them had not experienced that. So I think being treated that way gave them the confidence and the courage to to really do the work while they were there. So that's what I hear, you know, Absolutely. from so many people. And it, and it, it was a wonderful program. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. in the yeah. nature of, of, of yes. the world, um, it could not be sustained. Right. And without charging yeah. astronomical prices, which... Right. Just they just couldn't sustain it, so the yeah. hospital had to make that hard decision. Yeah. And uh, again, I know it was not made lightly. Yeah. It was yeah. a very difficult decision, yeah. but um, it does highlight. Yes. When you talk about the dearth of, of of residential programs, it highlights one of the reasons why. Yeah. The cost. Yeah. And from my understanding, again, not an insurance guy, but insurance. Uh, Evidently, is not paying as much as they yes. used to uh, right. for residential. So, again, these are issues. And it goes back to what I was saying before, that yeah. the cycle of addiction, yeah. the money that you need to have to treat it, yeah. it's it's very difficult. And if insurance doesn't pay for it, yeah. then you're out of pocket. And if you don't have that kind of money, you yeah. can't pay for it. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's a vicious uh, cycle. But I want to go back to uh, the other point you made or question you had about residential treatment in the state. Yes, it, there is a dearth. And yes, we need more. I would, I'm going to, you know, make a pitch for my colleagues in what we call the DMH contract world uh, for low income uh, and underinsured and uninsured individuals. Uh, Alethea House and Fellowship House right. and yeah. Pearson Hall. Yeah. In Jefferson County, those are our residential programs. Right. Um, and they get money from Department of Mental Health. Right. Now, they do what they can. Uh, Department of Mental Health is doing a great job in making sure that we have the funds to treat individuals. Right. But as the cost of, of operating an intense residential program goes up, staff cost, staff cost, 80% probably of, of your budget, uh, you know, food, all of the other costs involved. What you're getting reimbursed for, and now I would say get Chris Rattan or uh, yeah. somebody else in here to talk about this, but the yeah. cost, you're not getting reimbursed at a rate that is keeping up with the cost, cost. of living and the cost of doing business. So yeah. this is a problem. Yeah. DMH <laughs> is doing their best. And I know I'm, I've been on the budget committee, planning committee of, of Department of Mental Health uh, substance use programs. They're doing their best. Yeah. And they're out all the time talking to uh, uh, legislators, uh, trying to, you know, get more money for Department of Mental Health. I believe in them. Yeah. But that's a, the, the money is the issue. Right. So what do we do? Well, one of the problems is uh, brick and mortar. You gotta, you know, you can only you can only have beds in a space mm -hmm. where you can have beds. So you have to build. Well, there's not money to build facilities. Right. The money they are getting reimbursed. I say they. Those are my colleagues who provide residential treatment. The what they're getting reimbursed for is services. It's right. a fee for service. Right. There's not money out there to, I need a million dollars, for instance, to build 16 more beds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Five million to do however many. How do you build the beds? Yeah. How do you build the infrastructure? Yeah. So you see, you know, now I'm talking like, a, like an administrator. These are problems that yeah. we have, and it's money. Yeah. So we see more and more intensive outpatient, outpatient treatment right. programs right. because it's not as expensive. Yep. Yeah. So, are there other states that are having su some success? Do you? I don't even know if you know that. I mean, you know, w what would be beautiful is, and you know, we used to have a um, 
a group that Mark Wilson, mm-hmm. you know, ran that had everybody from, you know, prevention to early intervention, justice involved, treatment, sober living. I love that group. We I need, did too. We need to get that we together. We need to get again. that back together. Yeah, we had a good time. But but having, you know, I know that some of the states were uh, at that time beginning to dabble in, okay, what if, you know, you had a brick and mortar that did, you know, all the way from assessment, you know, a recovery resource center type assessment to detox to inpatient to outpatient to sober living in one location. Wouldn't that be great? Wow. So we're That'd talking the system of care. Yeah. And um, if you had all pieces of that system in one location, that would be amazing. Or connected. You know, yes, uh, very well connected. connected, yeah. And so when we talk about the system of care, what you're talking about, yeah. detox all the way to aftercare yeah. uh, and prevention, yeah. all wrapped in that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we need. Yeah. And by the way, Mark Wilson, amazing man. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, he's, he's been on the podcast. Yeah, you should watch yeah, that amazing. podcast. Yeah. I, would, yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to. Yeah. So uh, we're mentioning a part of the system of care is detox. Uh, that also seems to be problematic yeah. uh, in the state. Now, a lot of it we get is anecdotal because we work on the ground level with family support groups, and we're hearing those stories of, well, we, we got them to the emergency room, but you know they gave them a bottle of pills and then sent them back out or whatever. So that's anecdotal. But uh, there does seem to, to still be a problem with uh, people finding detox, in this state, can you anything you care to comment about that? Uh, Same problem. Yeah, detox is not treatment. Detox is often a necessary part of treatment. Right. So yeah. that's a um, and and DMH does fund detox. Uh, Pearson Hall is a right. Department of Mental Health funded detox program, um, and you know I I, I I can't speak a lot about accessibility there because I, I'm not so sure. I know that UAB definitely has detox beds, right. yeah. and uh, uh, Dr. Pete Lane uh, does a lot of work with with uh, detox there, and we do what we can. Again, when you talk about expense, right? Yeah. I noticed some private care uh, have popped up in Alabama recently in the last few years, specifically to do detox. So they may be filling some of the gap. Yeah. But again, you run back into that same thing with with under resourced folks. Yeah. Uh, how are they how are they going to take advantage of that? Yeah, so that's yeah. true. That's a, it is an issue. So, um, I would encourage people to reach out to Pearson Hall. Uh, they can actually let, let me back up. People can reach out to us, at Beacon at uabmc.edu or nine one seven three seven three three to schedule an assessment. Yeah. Yes, it is no charge. Uh, we we use the state of Alabama's assessment tool, which is just modified uh, ASAM assessment. Mm-hmm. It's a long, well, I say long. It's it's an in depth uh, assessment to try to really find out what the true needs are of an individual. Then our care coordinators will connect where they can. If you need detox, if that if that is a level of care that you assess for, they're going to work with you to try to find that detox. So I think the first step. Again, if you don't have resources, your first step is to be assessed either through us at, at Beacon mm. or at Lethia House does assessments, right. Fellowship House, any department, uh, uh, Ross, Resource Center, yeah. Ross. Resource Center yeah. anywhere, because then you can be connected to care. Yes. And that's that's the first step. You know, emergency room is, is, of course, if you have an emergency situation, definitely go to the emergency room. Yeah. Um, I do want to, you know, I do want to plug a new service that we have. I don't yeah, know if you've please heard of do. This. Um, Department of Mental Health. Let me back up a second. So I talked about the assessment for any contractor, Department of Mental Health substance use contractor. You have to have an assessment. Yeah. First, and then enrolled into care, and then charge for services. So that's how we work. What does that do? That that leaves a donut hole. Is what I call a donut hole from people who who aren't assessed yet, and especially people with opioid use disorders. Yeah, people who aren't assessed yet, and that's a very that's a as you, you all know, it's a very mm-hmm. dangerous yes. uh, 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 disorder. Yeah. Um, so you need to get people in care, if, especially if they're willing to get in care at that right. moment. 
window so, of opportunity. Absolutely. So what do you do? So somebody goes to the emergency room, right? Maybe. Yeah. I, I won't care. Okay. Then the emergency room, I know that our ER has traditionally, okay, here is, uh, in order to decrease the cravings, here's some uh, Suboxone. Yeah. And we're going to connect you to um, an assessment. Yeah. They connect to us. They connect to um, uh, RRC. Right. Great mm-hmm. group, by the way. Yeah. Yep. A number right. of them. Yep. But then what happens is a person leaves the ED, and they have to then go find that assessment. And then schedule the assessment, yeah. and then go through it. Yeah. That time lag yeah. is dangerous. It is. So Department of Mental Health, we talked to them about this. They gave us funding, since we're, we, we're connected to the emergency department, as yeah. you may be. Yeah. They gave us funding to set up a bridge clinic. So individuals can either walk into our bridge clinic, at 530 Beacon Parkway West. And Monday through Friday, we have hours. I think we're going 9 to 11 right now, 9 to 1030, but they can walk in at any time. And be, a, be see a doctor, see a physician, nurse, case workers, case managers, and assessors, and go ahead stabilize, get the medication they need without going to the emergency room. Yeah, wow. Get the medication they need, and immediately we set them up with an assessment and go ahead and get them into care. So we close that window, wow. theoretically. Wow. I did not know How about this. That? Rather. I mean, we're right. talking a few months, yeah. and we're trying okay. to get the word. We'll be getting the word out pretty soon, but yeah. it's operating right now. Okay. I think we've already seen in the past few months 80 people have oh come in, gosh. either been – Right. redirected from the emergency department yeah. or have just walked in. Yeah. So we're... Well, that's a great we're resource to, to know Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Yeah, it's... it's um, again, it's, the issue is that we can't care for an individual until we go through the assessment yeah. for our contract. Yeah. Department of Mental Health recognized that and said, okay, here's some funding to pay for some staff members yeah. and for medication. Yeah. yeah. Go. So, so you're condensing that, right? We can we can get you not only assessed but help treat medically, right at this time right in terms time. of stopping the emergency. And, right you know. now, I will say if you have a significant uh, need for medical care that right. only yes. the emergency Acute, room can yeah. 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 please go there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. please go there. Yeah. Right. This is for people who are contemplative, ready to yeah. get into care, and the MOUD, Medication for Opioid Disorders, really yes. does a great job in decreasing cravings and yes. getting them ready to go through the behavioral uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. health Treatment. process. Yeah. 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 So I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of that yeah. through our yes, uh, uh, through our integrated health clinic. Well I mean that's you know, like Art said, most of the calls that we're fielding, you know, and through family support, I mean that's that's what we're facing right there is right. that that whole, you know, issue of, you know, okay, medical detox, assessment, you know, waiting for a bed, you know, don't know what level of care. And then that time increases to, you know, two days, week, two weeks, and then they're right. they're gone again, you right. know. Yeah. Right. So that window closes when it closes you know, pretty fast. It does. Yeah, it, uh, uh, one other thing I'd like to ask about um, is the idea of adolescent uh, treatment or adolescent. Yes, I was Ill. about to ask about that. You so, were? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> and maybe even redefine the term adolescent because, uh, we, you know, I tend to think as a layman, oh, 18 and down or 19 and down, and, and that's not necessarily the case. But, again, uh, for whatever reason, that seems to be difficult for people to find as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, adolescents. Mm. Adolescents are, are a wonderful population. Many of us have had our own adolescent children. And, um, I was uh, an adolescent once. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I think all of Curious us. Curious, so still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, adolescence is a is a fascinating time, um, and individuals who have substance use uh, treatment needs who are adolescents are a can be a challenging group. 
Yes. I mean, you know, think about it from a developmental standpoint. Yes. You're, you're, you know, your brain's still, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, growing. And uh, then you also have the substance issue. You have you have your social issues, yes. your, 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 your peer issues. You can go through the list. And so it's a very, very difficult time. Yeah. We do have an, uh, a pretty robust adolescent program for outpatient and intensive outpatients. Right. And um, a lot of times, however, adolescents do need residential treatment. We try to, we, you know, we try to have the least restrictive care option. Yes. Uh, and, and in adolescence, you talk about stigma. You, yes. you really, mm -hmm. if, if we can treat somebody uh, outpatient, intensive outpatient, yeah. yep. we, we like to do that. Now, but many times... Some, Adolescents do need residential. It's very difficult to find residential beds. There are a few in the state. Yeah. Um, again, it's a it's a it's a tough group. And I think you know, just in the period of time, you know, that I've been in this world as far as the substance use, and I mean, I, I feel like the um, the adolescent piece has been growing. You know, the need. You know, just because of substances that are out there, the accessibility. Age the, of first use has dropped. Yeah, the, you know, the influence of um, perception of risk is decreasing, you know. So I, I feel like that's a space that we haven't gotten our hands around, you know, still. Yeah. Uh, just because, also, just what you said, age and stage, like, um, you know, I think we're going to look back in 10 years and 20 years and say, okay, that now that we were off there. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, we were trying yeah. really hard there, but like, you know, taking them out of their environment seems like a good thing. But at that age and stage, I don't know that we know. Like it's, uh, we're still, we're still fumbling around trying to figure out what, and, and I know it's not one size fits all, you know, just like with the adult population. Right. But, um, you know, so many of the people, the families that we're talking to you know, are dealing in this problem. You know, adolescents. It's, it's uh, almost like under age. Yeah, and the, the story we hear a lot is, well, they <laughs> they're they're not an adult, so we can't do this. Exactly. But they're not this, so we can't do that. And, and the parents feel really trapped. You know, because you know, in many times, they're they're not of age, so they are still responsible for them, but they cannot find you know the appropriate treatment options and whatever. So I think that we've still got a lot of room to figure um, this out, you know. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, I will go back to, then again, this is just one of the reasons is money. Oh, it, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we, we do have, like I said, we have an adolescent program. I think, not to divert on, I'm going to go back to yeah. this, but mm -hmm. what Addiction Prevention Coalition does do well is to get out there in the schools, get out there with, you know, yeah. you know, with, with parents and say, okay, how can we, how can we nip this in the bud at yeah. the beginning? Yeah. So I appreciate what yeah. you guys do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish I had answers for you. I do not. Yeah. Um, I do encourage if someone does have an adolescent who they suspect of having a substance use, uh, issue yeah. to, uh, give us a call. Yeah. And we'll set up an assessment, and then yep. we can help connect to care yes. where we can. It's the first step. I I do want to say, wow, what a what a almost what a very difficult place that is as a as a parent. Oh gosh, yeah. I mean, those of us who have had family members with with substance use uh, issues, yeah. Just with adults, it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But with adolescents, yes. that is a that can almost be a very hopeless place. And, yeah. and so I would say reach out, yeah. uh, reach out to us, reach out to other, you know, um, uh, uh, treatment facilities, try yeah. to get that, that help yeah. ASAP and reach out to APC. Yeah. I mean, families that are, you know, the family support groups that we do, I mean, I feel like, I mean, clearly we're very passionate about that because we've been there, you know, um, but those groups and those resources are so important for, parents and caregivers, guardians that find themselves in that space because it's not, you know, many times it's it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's a marathon. And, you know, there is education that we need as parents that we just don't have, you know, going into raising children, you know. A lot of the rules change, a lot of the dynamics change. 
It's all uh, the job training. So yeah. you need, and, you know, stigma is such a hindrance for these families to get help for their kids, but also for them to get the help that they need um, and the education and support. Because Well, on that you know, line, I was wondering if we could go back to something you said earlier, and I don't want you to uh, uh, betray anybody's confidentiality or anonymity, but you said that when it hit with your family, you kind of, okay, I kind of did some of the things you shouldn't do. Now, no. So maybe we can even close on this if you want to. Is is the people that are seeing this, maybe you could just share a little bit about, okay, that, now that I know I wouldn't do that again, and here's the kind of things I would encourage people to do. Does that make any sense? Yeah, sure does. And, again, caveat, not a clinician, just uh, somebody yeah. who's, who's been in the field. Yeah. But um, – what did I do? Well, uh, codependence is a big piece of this. Yeah, codependence is always, um, not always, but often the case with with family members uh, living with individuals who have substance use treatment. Needs. Yeah, w- whether that's a spouse or a child or a child. Yeah, yeah. and you know, covering up. Yeah, hiding, uh, getting just. To talk about me, yeah. getting angry yes. and treating it almost as well, treating it as a as a character flaw, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, shame. Yeah, all of these, you know, all of the things that push an individual away from treatment. Right. Right. I did. Yeah. And, and many we did too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Many yeah. of us do. Yeah. So, what what do you do? Um. You know, they're go online and find a list of what to do. Right. I think again, the first thing to do is to acknowledge it, own yes. it and say, Okay, this is happening. Yeah. Treat it like a brain based disease. Yep. It is. Okay. Think about it as again, if I if my child had cancer, what would I do? Right. I'd immediately get help. Yes. Don't delay that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and adolescents, they're tough, right? So yep. And people who are using substances can be tough. Yes. And uh, so that's going to be a very difficult thing. Yeah. But do what you can to reach out to the professionals who can get help, get a person, even a pre-contemplative person, yeah. yes. into treatment. That is the key. Yep. Don't hide uh, from your loved ones. You know, you need support. Yeah. That's one thing I found. I was hiding. Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, ooh, we, mm, it doesn't happen to our family. Yeah, it does. Yes. It happens to all, a lot of families. Yeah. And reach out to people. You would be surprised how many people yeah. have have gone through something similar. And so let me yes. tell you, grab your hand, you know, grab your hand and yes. yep. usher you to the next step. Yes, you need that help. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is to immediately identify it, yeah. acknowledge it, and find treatment, just like you would Any with other cancer. Thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We always, um, and I'm sure you've. Um, from the board have heard me say this, but like, you know, when we get the opportunity to go into workplaces or, um, you know, places where there are people that aren't necessarily, um, you know, looking for treatment or it's just the general public, you know, just having a conversation about what substance use disorder is, you know, how it manifests itself, signs and symptoms, how it happens, you know, either from students or from adults, just having that conversation, people, like, let their guard down and start talking. Mm -hmm. And one of our biggest messages is if we'll accept this as part of the human condition, you know, and seek help early and often, you know, it's not to the, okay, I'm, I'm concerned because, you know, I'm drinking more wine than I used to at night, you know. Go talk to somebody, you know, instead of waiting because we see it as a moral failing, because we see it that way, waiting, 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 waiting until, you know, it's so developed that it's so difficult to, you know, to stop. But absolutely, that's my soapbox. No, I think that is a good soapbox. Yeah. Uh, It's a good one to be on. Yeah. yeah, You get that help. Early and often. Early and often. Get the help. Well, and I can say as as someone who... um, regularly is is dealing with folks that are looking for resources while what you've shared may sound like you're kind of up in the ivory tower 
you have been so amazing to be uh, available when we've called to ask questions yes. or look for, and even to the point of saying, give them my number. Yeah. So I want people to know you're not up in that ivory tower. Yes. All day. <laughs> Thank you, you for that. On the ground, I appreciate yep. it. I, I, yep. I appreciate that art. I um, I do spend a lot of time with spreadsheets. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and I love out, a good spreadsheet. Uh, yeah, I have a coffee. I, one of my uh, staff members gave me a coffee mug that says, "Oh, this 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 calls for a spreadsheet." <laughs> um, or a whiteboard. Or a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, love em, it. Embrace what you do. Yes. Uh, and yeah. And so, but yes, and, and I, you know, uh, I'm always happy to help and connect people yeah. Thank where you. they need to go. But I would. I'm going to give that number again. Yeah. Yes, please, yeah, please, 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 please. Yes. Give, the number, yeah. give yeah. the number again. You know, it's um, if if you need an assessment or somebody needs an assessment yes. and needs help, yeah. call Beacon, yep. Beacon Recovery, yep. 205-917-3733. Okay. And or email at beacon at uabmc.edu. That's the medical center Perfect. email, uabmc. Um, I... Yes. Boy, we could talk forever, but yep. I wanted to point out uh, or, or add to what you had said earlier. When you're when you're talking about substance use, one of the things that I've found, and you do is we do this in the field, but we don't use stigmatizing language. Right. You know, we put the person first. Right. A person with substance use treatment needs. A person with substance use disorders. Yeah. We know. They're not addicts. Yeah. You know, they, these are these are people with you know, you know, with yeah. medical treatment needs, and I yes. and I and I throw that out there. We know it, but it's, it's very important, important to. Uh, yeah, to I, ha- I had a teacher once who used to say uh, in counseling, if you know, you've got to continue to understand that the person in front of you is a person to be loved, not a problem to be solved. Mm. Absolutely, and I've that's I've tried to hang on to that. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I'm gonna steal yeah. that. Yeah, you can yeah. have it. I stole it. You, okay, good. You can have it. Yeah, it reminds me of Bronwyn. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, she's Bronwyn. she's been such a um, an advocate about language. You know, yes. even from uh, you know healthcare professionals. Yeah. You know, doctors in the ER. And um, the other day, I got the opportunity to do a grand rounds uh, panel at UAB for pediatric residents oh, good. oh my gosh that conversation yeah. was amazing mm. to educate them about substance use disorder you know from the adolescents but also about the families yeah. how you know how they can talk to those parents and normalize what's going on um, instead of maybe overreacting to a substance use issue so I, I do see us making lots of progress, you know, across the board, so. but there's lots of work left to be done. So and again, we could talk forever, but yeah. residents, uh, medical students, even existing, uh, you know, uh, physicians uh, who have gone through their training, we find that it's very important yeah. to expose them to substance use and uh, substance use treatment and uh, to get them knowledgeable. And I think there's been, up until now, there's been a lack of that, you know, development for people that are going to be seeing patients. But again, because it, you know, it's been a rush. I mean, it's always been there, but the number of people it's affecting continues to increase. It really does. We we have a primary care clinic. You know that, right? Yeah. You know, okay, right. Okay. So Beacon Integrated Health within our program that anybody who is, uh, has a, Opioid use disorder uh, can we have physicians there to pr- provide the medication right. and monitoring? But our physicians are internal medicine docs, yeah, and so they also provide primary care. Yeah. So we treat the whole person. Yeah, what that has allowed us to do is is uh, internal medicine uh, rotates some of the residents all the time through our clinic oh, to great. expose them to yes. uh, substance use treatment. Yeah, it's so, beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah, for joining you. us today. Thank, thank you. you for your service on the board. Uh, thank you for it. being our friend and taking our calls when we have people that are really seeking treatment. It means, uh, means so much to us. We really uh, appreciate you. Reach out to us if, uh, if, if you need anything else. Okay. Yeah. Gary, uh, Dr. Dantzler, uh gave the phone number and the website for what they do. Why don't you give the APC 
a website for sure. inquiries and, sure. and, and a phone number, if yeah. you will. Yeah. So um, if you want to reach out to us, we would love that. Um, APCBHAM.org, 874-8498. Great. Right. And folks, really, the I think the, the, the word today really is as quickly as possible, reach out. Yep. We may not have the answer, but we know people that we can keep connecting you to. Absolutely. So, John, thank you yep. so much. Thank you, Mark. Folks, thanks for joining us for this episode of APC Recovery Cafe. We'll see you next time. One of the things that APC is known for is being a connector because we're stronger together. Not only are we there for those who are suffering through substance use disorder, but we're there for family members and we really take our job seriously. We all have personal reason why we're in this field, we're changing people's lives one community at a time.